Hey guys, Bowie here. This video is brought to you by Analog and Me. We decided to create something never done in video format before. The Bible of the mid lane is a collection of information mainly brought to you by Analog and then condensed into a well thought format that anyone can use to become a better player. In this video, he's revealing details, inside knowledge, secrets even, that very few mid players have the courage or the ability to express well, just so you can grow as a player. So make sure to like and subscribe, as well as visit his own YouTube channel that has videos in Portuguese with English subtitles if you want this series to continue. You read the title, we're talking Invoker, and our format in this video is to discuss nine matchups we feel are important for the hero. We arrange them into easy, even, and hard matchups so that you can not only recognize them, but adapt accordingly. We'll start with the easy matchups first, and our first hero to talk about is Ember Spirit. Ember Spirit is one of the matchups where Invoker benefits way more from playing Quasvex instead of Exor Quas. Not only your Tornado can dispel Flame Guard, but you offer more control when you completely crush the lane versus him. When we're talking starting items, you want to go with a pretty standard build with a slight twist. Most intelligence mid heroes start with double mental of intelligence and one circlet. And that's usually true for Exor Invoker, but when you're playing Invoker Quasvex, Urn is one of your biggest allies, and thus, to get to that power spike faster, you only build one no talisman but you still get a second circlet because you know you want that for the laning and you can turn that into an urn later down the line. One really subtle but game-changing tip Analog has is no warding your mid lane versus Ember and that might seem weird, but it makes perfect sense. Just hear me out. You see, Ember has no way to harass Invoker. The only thing he can do in that matchup is draw aggro hoping that he's far away enough to take less harass and get creeps. But you cannot aggro anything at all times. If you're invisible, for instance, the creeps don't have vision of you, so even if you try to right-click an enemy hero again and again and again, you're not going to aggro it. If the creeps are in the low ground and you don't have a ward in your side of the map, and we're talking Invoker, Ember cannot draw aggro. The only way for Ember to draw aggro is to move down, where the creeps have vision, to the low ground, risking more harass, taking spells, only for the small chance to get CS. This, my friends, is a pro tip. So yeah, don't bother warding the lane in this matchup and instead just get ready for blocking. Some heroes can aid in the rune fights, but Invoker not only is an awful level 1 hero, he's also really slow, meaning you will probably miss CS or be forced to TP, you don't want to do that, just focus on blocking especially, because when you're playing Quaswex, your CS in the first wave is way worse than Ember. By getting a good block, you have the ability to draw aggro to your tower and not be challenged by Ember's better attack damage and also melee attack range, meaning he's always much more effective at denying and getting creeps. And since this is an easy matchup, you want to start the best way possible. You don't want him getting any denies, so you can get level 2 in the second wave, and then you have the ability to stop Ember doing the only thing he can do to get a range creep, using Flame Guard. Skill build-wise, you always want to start with Quas instead of Wex. EMP is an awful spell level 1, and the attack speed is deceptively bad this early since you have no raw damage. Whereas Quas allows you to trade much better because of the HP region, and Quas can also be used as a way to prevent Ember from denying a range creep by cancelling his attack animation with Cold Snap. Or preventing Ember from getting the range creep the same way, just like Analog does here. At level 3, you want to have 2 points of Quas and 1 of Wex. The HP region is still more valuable than attack speed, and while you get more tornado damage and EMP drain, what you care about here is the dispel and the ability to lane and be very aggressive on harassing Ember. Your tornado already deals 105 damage with only 1 Wex point, which is more than most level 1 nukes, so securing a range creep will not be a problem. After that, you keep prioritizing Wex with about 4 to 5 points in Quas, depending on the game. Your playstyle in the lane should focus on dispelling Flame Guard with Tornado, in case Ember uses it right at the start of the wave, or using it to harass Ember while you kill the range creep at the end of it. EMP should never be used until you have 3 points of wax, unless that's a sure kill, since you actually suffer quite a bit with mana. Speaking of mana, we will tie playstyle and mana problems together. Stick is a priority in this lane because Ember's only way of ever getting creeps is using Flame Guard and Slide of Fist, and you actually struggle with mana pre-level 5, since as we talked about, using EMP is not worth it, and also hard to land. The Stick gives you that extra bit of mana, so you constantly pressure, and you can also fare a couple of mangoes and tangles for you. Salve is rarely needed in this matchup because you have Quas HP region, and after Stick, you want to get Phase Boots starting with Blades of Attack, since your base damage is awful and you have a ton of attack speed because of your Wax, followed obviously by the Mighty Urn. At level 5, you start to play really aggressively. The Cold Snap, Tornado, EMP combo suddenly becomes viable. By hitting the combo, you can steal up to 250 mana, which almost pays itself. 
and rendering Ember useless since he has four active abilities. You're probably gonna dispel the Flame Guard as you get the Tornado anyways. Now he will be forced to either jungle or constantly fare selves and mangoes to no avail. If you're playing a high MR game, Ember might be able to slide of his dodge or EMP. So one thing you can do is wait for the slide of his to be used as he tries to harass you or get a creep and then go for the combo. The next subject we have to talk about is runes. Usually Invoker is a hero that doesn't care about runes. But what Analog told me is that once Ember gets a bottle, runes actually become important to you. While you're slow, Ember's only way of going back to the lane or jungling or ganking are runes, and thus your priorities shift. So while we mentioned not warding your mid lane against Ember, it's interesting that you ward the runes, but in a way that's far away enough from the lane so that he cannot draw aggro. With enough harass and pressure, not only Ember, even with vision, will struggle to walk up to the rune, but he will have knowledge of where exactly it is, so you can deny it from him. Honestly, focus on doing that because suddenly, one Ember that is level 5 with no mana can find a regen or a haste rune, get a couple of kills, ignore your lane, and start snowballing, and all of your efforts are now way less impactful. Always check if the enemy has a bottle, if it's empty or not, and be more mindful. The last subject in this lane is kill potential. Your actual kill potential starts at around level 4 to 5, but for you to get kills, you need to constantly apply pressure, and that's easy, because you have infinite HP regen and Ember will barely tickle you. Focus on punishing Ember on every creep he goes for with right clicks, since you have so much HP regen, and make sure to try and hit him when you try to secure range creeps with Tornado, for instance. While your base damage is low, they will add up, especially since you can do it so freely. In general, just keep constant pressure up to level 4 or 5, and that's when you're probably going to have the bigger chance of actually bringing him down. The next hero of the list is Death Prophet. For the item build in this matchup, you can always go for the normal double mantle of intelligence build with one circlet, but Analog actually prefers the same build we showed for the Ember matchup. The difference here is that the second circlet actually becomes a no talisman instead of an urn. In general, circlet is less expensive, and while you lose one intelligence, the extra HP and agility synergize really well, especially since you already get pretty good base damage with Exhort anyways. With most of the ranged matchups when playing Invoker, the ward is quite straightforward, you want vision of the rune and the mid lane. Analog suggests that you ward your right side on the radiant side and the left side on the dire side, since usually you have to walk more to the opposite side if you want to check it with your hero. So you always want to have an easy way to at least see which ward it is and you want to walk the least because Invoker is actually pretty slow. Invoker is a really slow hero. Almost any hero in the game can ward faster than you, which means your warding needs to account for the fact that there's almost 100% certainty of enemy vision in the mid lane before you arrive. That means, for your wards to be undetected, you have to ward under fog. On the radiant side, you can only ward the right side undetected, meaning you have to choose in between one of these two options, and on the dire side, you have two sides to choose from, but the left ward gives a little bit less lane vision than the right one. It's up to you to decide which one fits your needs better. Because of that, you can almost always spot the rune that spawns every two minutes, making your life easier and preventing ganks and unusual situations from happening. Blocking is quite straightforward for Invoker, and we will not touch on the subject from here on. As we talked about, Quaswex Invoker really wants great blocking because of his base damage, but Exhort Invoker, even with better damage, always does it since you have nothing else to do. The usual build for this hero is Exhort, Quas, Exhort, and that's completely okay. That said, Analog has a suggestion, especially if you're playing against better players, if you're a better player yourself. Better players understand how important it is to constantly kill your Forge Spirit. Forge Spirit is your way to harass and CS battering lane, but at level 1, he has only 300 attack range and 300 HP, and he doesn't last for the entire cooldown of Forge Spirit. So it's really easy for good players to kill it, reducing your CS, or they get extra XP and gold. The second point in Quasi level 3 not only allows you to have infinite Forge Spirit duration since the duration, HP and attack range scales with Quas, but it also means attacking from further away so it takes less damage and it has more HP while you still have 92 combined damage anyways. A lot of the times you don't need more damage than that, but going for Exhort is not wrong if you're used to it or if you just want to go for it. After that you can get Exhort at 4 and 5, and at 6 Wax is amazing, because it gives you the ability to use the Sumia combo. The highest DPS combo you have at this stage, and the way to do the highest amount of damage is to already have an Invoked Forge Spirit, while you get Cold Snap, Tornado, followed by a Meteor, and the hits from the Forge. 
If you're close enough from the target, you can always save the cold snap for after the tornado, but often it's an easier way to land the tornado since Death Prophet is a ranged hero, which also sets up the whole combo, so you want to make sure you land it. Every game is different, so play accordingly. Going back to the lane, Analog's advice is to summon Forge Spirit when the creeps meet and not preemptively, especially early on. Because you want to maximize the duration of your Forge Spirit, you don't want it dying right as you're about to hit the range creep. And remember to use Sunstrike to get a range creep when you're level 1. In general, you always want your Forge Spirit active after level 2 quas, and that also means being careful with it so it survives the whole duration, granting you better CS control, harass, and obviously not giving experience away. Your item build as an Exhort Invoker is much less structured than Quaswax that always wants face earn for the damage plus chase. In general though, finishing a Null into a stick, into another Null or Boots is never too wrong versus Death Prophet. You want to dominate the CS game since her animation on both attacks and the Q is bad. After that, Treads, Drums, Ags or Treads, U Scepter, depending on the game, can be really good, but we're only focusing on the lane in this video. In this matchup, since you're playing Xor Quas, your Forge Spirit being alive also gives you the chance to deny the rune from Death Prophet, unless she preemptively sets up, which almost always means she will miss CS or will take tower damage. Remember that on Radiant, the left side is the closest one, so you always send the Forge to the right side, or the opposite on the dire side, and this means you're gonna lose less experience and gold from creeps, whilst denying any chance from Death Prophet to recover. Thank you, Analog. Q Potential starts at level 3 in this matchup. At this stage, you always want to have Cold Snap and Forge as your active skills. Ice Wall and Sunstrike are usually the follow-up spells that you can use. If you went for level 2 Exhort at level 3, then Sunstrike is probably a better idea, and if you went for Quas, Ice Wall is going to be more effective. But read every game and decide for yourself how you want to play. From this point onward, DP already starts fearing for her life, and it only gets worse as you get more levels up to level 6, where the Samia combo is also an option we talked about. Lastly, we have Lashrak. This matchup has similar components from the first two we talked about. Your item build is exactly like the Ember game, but your ward is exactly like the second one. You do want to have lane vision, and obviously controlling runes against a hero like Lashrak is going to be quite important. The reason for Lashrak to be considered an easy matchup against Invoker is that while he's fast, most of his cast points suck. That means Cold Snap we've earned is incredible versus him, and he's just a big pool of mana that you can constantly drain with EMP, and like Ember, he offers absolutely nothing without mana. His skill build is identical to the one we mentioned on the Ember matchup, and the playstyle is also very similar. Unlike Ember, Lash doesn't deny nearly as effectively, so the only thing you have to keep tabs is his Split Earth shenanigans, and you can always use Cold Snap on him to cancel it, just like Analog does here. It costs less mana than Tornado, and it gives you the chance to still maintain dominance in lane. When we're talking runes, Lestrak is definitely a hero you have to keep tabs. Not only he rotates really well, he's faster than Ember, and we'll probably get a bottle faster because the early levels are actually decentish for Lestrak. That said, don't be fooled into getting boots just so you can get runes faster. Blades of Attack really increases your lane CS, your kill potential, especially considering how much attack speed you get from Wax. Just always be ready to walk up to the side of the map and deny it at the right moments. One interesting advice is that even though one seems really good versus the Shrak because of so many actives on the hero, sticking with the stick and grabbing earn a sap is more desirable. This is an easy matchup as we already established, and thus you want to be playing on the aggressive side and not on the passive one. From level 5 onwards, Lashrak will always be really low in mana and HP. According to Analog, the way Lashrak comes back from this game is stacking the jungle for himself and just coming back when the creeps are hitting the tower. This way, it's harder for you to combo the Lashrak, but well, we're not here to help Lashrak players anyway. Now we're talking the even matchups, and we'll start with Shadowfiend. This matchup is quite tricky and can go either way, whether you play Exhort or Quaswax, but Analog recommends Quas as the slightly better way to go about it. Not only Shadowfiend can easily kill the four Spirits with two attacks in a raise level 3+, giving him experience advantage while actually hindering your ability to last hit, but Shadowfiend without mana is pretty useless early on, and so you force him into a different playstyle, ferrying more mangoes and slowing his early rotation since he is never gonna be ready. We already established the warding and blocking, you're against a ranged hero, so you want lane vision as well as rune vision. One thing to add about blocking in these even matchups is that they don't matter as much as they do in the easy ones. Let me explain. If you're playing with friends, or you're in a high MMR game, when there's communication, Invoker can aid and be very useful in level 1 kills when contesting the rune because of Cold Snap. So if you feel like you have a great setup for a kill, avoiding the block is not the end of the world, and a global win is clearly better than getting one extra melee creep because of your block. But remember, people are dumb, and in general, blocking is safer, but if you feel like your team really wants to go for it, it's not wrong, and it can be really good. 
Shadow Fiend has pretty bad base damage level 1, so you want to make sure he doesn't deny any creeps, so you get your level 2 in the second wave, and then you always have the tornado to never miss any range creeps. Shadow Fiend will usually hunt for rooms, and since this is a fake matchup, we didn't really showcase that, but here's what Analog has to say. You're slower than Shadow Fiend, but when you're on the Radiant side and the room spawns top, or when you're dying and it spawns bottom, it's desirable that you contest it with Cold Snap and Tornado, because that can become a kill, and it's just a great way to annoy him. In general, your item build is the same we talked about on other Quaswex matchups, with a slight addition in case you're playing Exhort Invoker. Raindrops after your no talismans when you're going for Exhort. Analog was testing Raindrops as a Quaswex Invoker here, and in his opinion it's a waste of gold because he has enough HP regen and he drains so much mana from Shadowfiend that you don't actually need it, but as Exhort Invoker, he says it's a great item. The Quaswex playstyle might not give you the best yes in lane, but as long as you're hitting SF and the range creep constantly while you're harassing, you're going to be okay. Usually Shadow Fiends, at least the good ones, start with raise level 1, and what they do is they push the first wave aggressively, so not only you as a low base damage invoker gets pretty few CS, he can also later get CS with raises under his tower, already level 2, boosting his souls, and it's kinda hard for you to contest him. And that's reliable because it's unlikely you'll get denies in the first wave if he raises correctly. That said, it gives you the chance to harass him when he's under his tower, and also, since he will try to aggressively deny under your tower, it's quite easy to get the Tornado plus range creep as he disengages. Note how many right clicks Analog outputs as SF runs away from the tower here. While it might look like Analog doesn't have that much CS, the constant right click and Tornado are reliable enough to force a fair amount of salves, and at the end of the day, the net worths will be really similar when both players have the same skill. Kill potential against Shadowfin comes after level 5, but usually even after that, it's unlikely that you'll burst him in one go, unless he's sloppy with his region or he doesn't bring any mangoes or a stick. Watch how Analog goes about killing SF. He's using one salve, and he checks for his items. Raindrops and no stick or mango, meaning as long as he gets the EMP off, SF can at best get one raise in between the tornado and EMP proccing, while he has stick and fairy fire. In this particular case, it's not needed that he gets super close to the Shadow Fiend, since he has no mango or stick, but remember to check and do it if your enemy does, because you're gonna get double raise, and you're never gonna kill him before he kills you. Analog switches to Wax and just right-clicks him as much as he can. Usually that's how you start the kill, you render him weak enough to go for another tornado later, and the important part of all of this is Analog bought a 5-minute ward to substitute his, and that gives him the chance to cancel the self. Asef thought he was safe because it's nighttime, and at the same time he was regening with Quaz giving him, finally, a chance to kill the Shadow Fiend. As the lane unfolds, know that he has Tornado, then even though SF is kinda low and he had Tornado and could maybe get the range creep and go for a kill, he wants to use his range creep as bait, because then he has way more chasing power over the Shadow Fiend. He knows SF has no mana, and that's finally a kill. Might seem complicated, and it is a little bit because the matchup is really close, but hopefully it allowed you to understand a little bit more about it, and you can use some of this in your games in the future. Puck's the next hero we have to talk about. Very similar to SF, Puck has the attack range and AoE to crush your four spirits, and that combined with your better HP region is why Quaswax is a better build for this matchup. Your item build is the same for Quaswax as always. One thing to remember about Puck, especially if he learns Orb Level 1, is that he will get the ward sooner than you. Now, we do recommend getting Rune Vision always, because contesting that from Puck when he has a bot is imperative. Skill build wise, there is a slight twist at level 5. Since comboing Puck is so hard because of his mobility and phase shift, you do benefit a little more from learning Quaz instead of Wax. Even though theoretically draining mana from Puck is amazing, you're almost never gonna be able to pull it off. Thank you, Analog. Comboing Puck in general is really hard, so it's imperative that you understand exactly when he learns Phase Shift in the matchup. Having a Tornado dodge by Phase Shift when you use it only for Horaz is a big loss you don't want to take, so in general, avoid initiating a big effort combo like Cold Snap Tornado unless you're sure it's been used. In general, trade heavily with right clicks and you should always use Tornado for the range creep, but if you can time the range creep dying with forcing Phase Shift at the same time so you can hit both, you'll turn that matchup from even into something a little bit more invoker favored. With that out of the way, level 1 is very similar from everything we talked about. In general, it's a little harder to prevent Puck from getting range CS because with either one in Rift or Orb, he can time the right click and the skill has no cast point, but it's still important to try and prevent him from denying his. According to Analog, drawing aggro is really important in this matchup, since unlike Shadow Fiend, Puck has amazing base damage, and he can deny a fair amount of creeps if you don't move it away from him, so you can abuse the projectile speed. 
In general, Puck nowadays learns Phase Shift at level 4, so you can see that he did get the Tornado and Range Creep here, but always test with a couple of right clicks to see if Puck learned the spell when you want to go for it. In terms of kill potential, there's almost no chance to kill Puck when both players are of the same caliber. The way you play this matchup is just pressure him constantly regardless of killing him or not so he cannot gank. All analog wants from you in this matchup is that you buy a 5 minute ward, respawn to the side lanes, and just play normal invoker. That said, Puck also cannot kill you unless heroes rotate middle since you already have so much HP regen, and you even go for the third quest point at level 5 as we already mentioned. OD is the final matchup we're going to talk about, and he is quite different from the other ones. In terms of starting items, wards and blocking, there's almost no change from the other Quasvax matchups we talked about, but the playstyle in the mid lane is different. Basically what OD wants to do every wave is ban Invoker so that OD gets his rain CS and also denies his own range creep. The way you deal with it is position yourself accordingly and also drawing aggro. The way Analog suggests you play level 1 is, you don't want both melee creeps hitting two range creeps or the mage trade, because then he can deny his mage and get yours. Whether OD aggros or not, don't aggro all the creeps, only one or two to avoid that scenario. He prevents the deny, and since OD was greedy with his Astro, he gets a deny on top of it. Being away from OD is why at level 3, Invoker learns Wax instead of Quas. Not only OD doesn't have enough harass for you to bother with more Quas, and until level 3 in Boots or level 5 in Boots, he's not gonna have a way to actually get the Astro on you, so there's actually no harass coming. Since you're constantly drawing aggro, and now you can because of Tornado, you can stop him mid-walk towards you and secure the range creep. Increasing the range of Tornado is the perfect way to accomplish that. Another analog tip about this matchup is that the early stick we talked about for so long is not needed. OD uses one spell per wave and he's rarely gonna be using it on you early as we talked about. He doesn't see the value in the item and gets it after the No Talisman is done. That said, this means you're faring a mango ideally when you finish your first No Talisman because you're using Cold Snap in the first wave to secure Rain CS, Tornado in the second one, and as we already discussed, Invoker Quazwez is quite mana hungry before level 5, where EMP starts to become a possibility. As you probably noticed, the chance that you get a Rain CS with a right click in this matchup is almost no, if OD has a brain, and thus mangoes are more important than normal. Even level 5 though, you'll probably keep bringing mangoes because you want to keep the pressure up, drain his mana, secure range creeps, etc. Phase boot starting with Blaze of Attack and Earn is always your goal and don't bother finishing your one until that point. The 250 gold is like half of the gold you need to finish earn since you already own a circlet and the tempo of invoker is critical. You don't want to waste any time to get online. In terms of playstyle in lane, there's a lot of things to keep in mind. I'll show some examples of small things Analog realized about it. The first one is, since you go to points of wax at level 3, you have a lot of attack speed. There are scenarios where OD bans you close to range creep and it gets in deny range after the astro, and usually any hero that tries to deny it ends up sad because OD last hits it, but you have so much attack speed that you can usually attack twice before him since you're close and you have double X. Another small thing about this matchup is that if two range creeps accumulate, you have to be wary about using Tornado to last hit one if the other one is not full HP because the other one will be in deny range and you will lose it. OD doesn't really care about runes that much, so you as an invoker can control them, especially after urn and face boots, and your kill potential in this lane is related to how bad OD is. Good ODs understand that after level 5 it's really tough for them to step in the lane, so what they do is jungle and come back when the creeps hit their tower, but bad ODs will still try to do the same thing by banning range creep close to Invoker, and once Astro is out, that's really when you can hit your entire combo similar to Puck and Ember. The same tip that Analog gave to the Leshrac players is the same one here. OD needs to jungle at level 5 instead of just being in lane and using Fairy Mangos and losing mana to invoke. One thing that got me confused is the fact that he chose Quas Wax as the better alternative against TA. Everyone knows that Invoker doesn't have a lot of instances of damage as Quas Wax, and so Exhort seems like an easy way to break Refraction, have kill potential with the Sumia combo, but not only she, like many of the matchups we talked about, can easily deal with the 4 experience snowball even harder on you, Xor Quas doesn't pressure as much as Quas Wax early, and you'll see that clearly in the video. Analog told me it's playable, but you have to be very good at Exhort Invoker to pull it off. That said, this is a hard matchup, so you're not going to win the lane by going Quas Wax, and we're gonna show both of them. We'll start with Exhort just to showcase the huge difference in between the two styles. Always remember, to sunstrike the enemy fountain to get her info bell lanes and wards. It might not look so tough here because analog is really really good, but whenever you're facing a TA of your caliber, expect to struggle.
This matchup is all about punishing TA in the early levels, where she has no refraction and attack range while also drawing aggro. Missing a CS is way less of a problem than not only having TA deny it, but also dealing damage to you with Psyblades when you have Exhort activated so you don't have any HP regen. Whenever you Sunstrike the range creep, consider the side the enemy here is, just like Analog did it here, so he has less of a chance that he tanks it with his body. One cool trick I picked from Analog is the way he draws aggro. The creep that is in front is already the creep that will die faster, so Analog starts by already prepping him early with one attack and then he only uses aggro when he wants to last hit, so it's a creep that dies a little faster and the enemy is probably not expecting to have to deny it so early. The dance around the creeps is quite important, and the aggro too. It allows you to position away from TA, and as we said, make sure no creeps get denied. You can see the same trick in this other matchup. Because TA can kill your 4 spirit so easily at level 2, consider summoning it when the ranged creep will die. That said, it's no guarantee you're gonna get it anyways. Look how much damage Invoker takes in this wave. Because the matchup is this hard, a Tango is very likely the first item you'll have to pick, and with the Courier being so slow nowadays, we suggest you buy it every game, because when you realize you need one, it's gonna be too late. Even if you're good, the first levels are a pain in the butt, and you just need to avoid Psyblade. Since the range creep is all you care about in a matchup this one-sided, note how Analog doesn't summon his in this wave since TA is already pushing aggressively and he might risk having it take unnecessary damage. When the range creep becomes available, easy. That said, TAs have a tendency of overpressuring under tower since they have refraction, but as long as you take good care of your force spirit, it can be deadly to her. Doesn't happen often, but take advantage of it. Once Invoker gets level 6, then the Sumia combo we mentioned in the Death Prophet video becomes available and you have kill potential on TA, but in case you fail, whether by forgetting about a wand, a fairy fire, and then she's able to use his refraction at the right moment, you're dead, so be careful. One thing to be very careful about once TA gets level 6 is Sentry Wards. Analog gets baited by TA thinking he had an easy kill, but that trap was the difference between a kill and a death. Don't be shy on sentries against his opponent. Quasvex Invoker is miles better versus TA in the first levels, and the reason is simple. You tank creeps better, and so you can do things like this. Analog draws aggro one time so that his range creep doesn't die fast enough for TA to contest the other one, and that's beautiful, he gets a CS. Very nice, Analog. He also does that while he doesn't align for Psy Blades because he tanks creeps better. He can also hit TA like this and not care as much about the creeps hitting him, and those things add up. Look at TA's HP in this second wave all because he can spin around the creeps and hit TA instead of just try to get CS while he moves. On top of that, Tornado is a way more reliable way and less of a commitment way to get range creeps than trying to use your forward spirit for it. That's not even counting the fact that you harass TA at the same time if Refraction is not up. You want another reason for Quaswex? You can cancel selves with Tornado. Well, that said, let's continue. We didn't talk about block up to this point, but this is one of the matchups where it matters very little if you're blocking or not. So if you have any allies in the offlane, go Aiden, you might get first blood, that's gonna help a lot in the laning stage. TA wants a static lane, and that's the opposite of what you want, because static lane and Psyblade Haraz walk hand in hand. Note how Analog draws aggro in the weirdest way possible here, can you see it? Instead of drawing aggro to the range creep, he switches which melee creeps are attacking each other in a 90 degree angle from what it was before. It's much more uncomfortable for TA to harass like this, When it's time for CS, Analog obviously draws aggro again. Worth noting that he could probably get the range CS with Tornado here, but I think we already covered this. If a creep has 0% chance of being denied and it's a hard matchup, save your Tornado for the next one. A good tip, since you'll be dancing around close to TA all the time, is to Tornado as close as possible to her when getting range CS, because it makes sure it's harder for her to refraction dodge the damage. Analog constantly used this aggro technique to position himself in a safer way, while luring TA to get her ass in range creeps constantly. 
That said, as the matchups unfold, you have no kill potential on TA until your urn is ready, and if she just ignores mana, you can't even drain mana from her to be more active. So it's really a question about how confident you are on your Exod Invoker, and whether it's a good Quasvex Invoker in general, maybe there's a Spirit Vessel hero on the enemy team that you really want that Spirit Vessel. But yeah, just like Analog said for Puck, you basically want to respond to side lanes and play very aggressively mid. Conker is a weird matchup for Invoker because Quaswax, as you probably noticed, already handles him pretty well. Analog said he considers it almost an even matchup, and because of that we will only use Exhort because that matchup is actually quite tough for a multitude of reasons. Like Amber, you don't want to give Kanka the luxury of drawing aggro easily, so pardon Analog, he was up pretty late playing this matchup and warded the wrong place. And you might be wondering, why would you play Exhort Invoker if it's not the greatest? Well, maybe you have a Void in your team and you think that an Exhort is going to be better. There's a lot of different reasons for that. There's no secret in this matchup regarding level 1. But after 2, microing your 4 spirits well makes or breaks the lane. Summoning 4 spirit after Tidebringer gets used or just as you're trying to deny the range creep are good ways to make sure you don't fall behind. And obviously, taking care of your babies at this point is common knowledge because you don't want to give experience away. Against good players, you will be forced into another point of quasi level 3 because they'll make everything to kill your fort spirits and you want to give them more hp as well as more hp region for you but if you're not feeling that pressure you can get away with exhort and the extra damage in her as on kanka as levels pass the range of tidebringer as well as the damage increases so you need to respect it when kanka goes for the range creep keep tabs on his hp at all times Analog loves to bait his range creep a little bit when he knows Tidebringers on cooldown. This is usually possible up to level 5 because the cooldown gets too fast then. And then as the force spirit gets low, he just retreats it completely if it's level 1. In terms of item build, a buckler is necessary here. First, he fares a mango and a tango, then a no talisman and a ring of protection, followed by the buckler recipe and more region. A good tip that you can see Analog execute here is using cold snap only after the attack animation starts. It seems small, but that's 120 extra damage from him and the Forge that would kinda get lost since Kanka loses more time when his attack animation gets wasted. At level 5, you have the choice of getting Quas level 3 or Exhort. Analog prefer to fare two salves and still got Exhort since one of the reasons going Exhort is good is that you actually have kill potential on Kanka with the Sumia combo. That doesn't really happen if you go for level 3 Kha's. Because you're not playing Quas Vex Invoker, Kanka has the luxury of getting free region with XTP and going back to base. So even though Analog is a god and is out-leveling Kanka in this hard matchup, the matchup still looks pretty hard. Kanka will start to combo you and Analog deals with it the best way possible. He tries to stop the torrent animation with a cold snap and while he doesn't, he buys time and he moves his forge to the other side so that Kanka cannot kill him with Tidebringer. The minus armor and the extra damage actually turns the tides of the play and Kanka is forced to retreat. While he survives, he has a Buckler, an old Talisman at level 5 and still needs to buy more region as Kanka keeps pressuring more and more and yeah, except you'll be faring selves and mangoes for a while. While there is kill potential with Exhort Invoker, it's definitely not easy. Look how Analog's two selves become nothing. And at level 6, if the Kanka is any good, he will bring a dust in case you try to flee with Ghost Walk when he tries to combo you with the boat. The best bet is usually to try and force the Sumia combo before Kanka tries to combo you. This will force the boat, but if you're any good, you're gonna dodge the boat. Brood vs Invoker is one of the hardest matchups in the game. Ideally, what you want to do in a scenario you get brooded is pray that you have any other core in your team that can lane better versus her, so that you lane top or bottom. If that's not the case, then you have to play Quas Wax and go against Brood Mama. In the past, Stealth Shoot was actually a viable option versus her, but Ice Frog took that away, meaning your build is just a straightforward normal build. We had a problem when recording this matchup, Analog doesn't like going 1 versus 1 against any player, just because while we're making all of this info public, not everything that is said in the lobby goes to the video necessarily, since he decides what he wants to share or not. That said, his partner got sick, and our goal was to post this video before the minor, and thus, we ended up finding a replacement, but he doesn't play Brood, so we found Miracle and Sumia's footage of games uh, where they were able to hand a brood. Before we get into that, remember that there's only two recent videos of a win like this and in the Miracle game his Earth Spirit pretty much came mid like a champ to make sure he could handle. In the Sumia game we have no idea of the average MMR of the game and how good the brood was and also if you bank on being as good as Sumia to win this lane I got some really bad news for you. The only bad level for Brood in this matchup is 1 and maybe 2, so your job is to hit her non-stop and also pray that you have a hero that can gank mid and use all of that harass. You can see that in this game Miracle gets a good block and that not only helps him hit the Brood non-stop as the tower hits the creeps, but pushes the wave giving him early level 2 for more harass with the tornado as well as under tower. 
That said, after level 3 you have to be extremely careful with even using Tornado for a ranged creep since that opens up an opportunity for Invoker. In this Miracle game, he has TPs at level 2 to help Miracle and that's really what makes this game even winnable. And even if the TP they don't get a kill instantly, forcing Air Spirit to stay around for minutes so Invoker survives to eventually get a kill. But without that edge, this matchup is close to impossible if the Brood is as killed as the Invoker. Even though ES is mid, Miracle can barely CS since there's too many spiders there. One tip in your games after level 4 or 5 when Brood doesn't have a dust is to actually consider if you want your Ghostwalk to survive a dive. It costs 200 mana and if you're left with no resources to go back to the lane like Mangos and Aself, you have to now walk back to the base and that takes way longer than just dying. Dying actually benefits you more than using ghosts in some scenarios, so be wary and try to think about it. Even in this Miracle game, Brood was extra sloppy with her positioning and HP, knowing ES was not showing, and ends up giving another kill, and if that happens, maybe you can get enough of an edge to win the game, but against a great Brood, you better pray someone feeds. In terms of items and like anything, it's just really really hard, you have to play incredibly safe, you have to save Tornado so you can maybe run away, Buying boots early doesn't help that much because Brood is insanely fast and she has a slow. Ganking this early with no earn, no face boots, no items is also pointless. So yeah, you just have to pray for some TPs metal. You have to force dives from the Brood Mother. It's really all about how good she is with the hero rather than how good you are with Invoker. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. This has to be the best content I have ever created, and that's thanks to Analog's help. Not only knowledge, but recording these matchups, discussing Dota, and ideas. This video alone took us two weeks to record and edit, and while we love to create content like this, the time consumed is huge, especially for Analog that has to give up screams, pubbing, or even social life. If you guys enjoy this content, consider checking the Patreon we created specifically for this project. We want to keep all of this content free, and if this interests you, check our page. You can support us for $1, you can be part of the vote for the next heroes and matches we choose, and you can also be a part of the process to not only see footage before it gets released, but to learn a lot of niche crazy Dota tips for 10 bucks. Thank you a lot, have a good one.